Good morning, afternoon, everyone. Hello and welcome to our webinar on electrified community car sharing. My name is Symbiat Yusuf, Member Relations Manager at Ford, and I will be moderating this panel today. Today, we'll hear from our speakers where we'll be highlighting current car sharing programs making electric vehicles accessible to all communities. Before we start today, uh, the presentation today, we have a few announcements from the four team, and um, we will start the webinar um, shortly after those announcements. Attendees, we ask that you please make sure to submit all your questions through the attendee chat. We will get through the questions during the Q&A. We will also be sharing the presentation slides and the presentation recording with you all after the webinar today. And we love to start with a brief introduction about Forth, who we are and what we do. Uh, Forth is a nonprofit trade association advocating for smart transportation. Through our work in industry development, demonstration projects, policy advocacy, and consumer engagement, we are open to advance equitable clean transportation. If you would like to hear more about Forth, joining our member program, and upcoming events, we ask that you please visit us at forthmobility.org for all of that information. And we are so excited that our 2021 Roadmap Conference is moving to a virtual format. This year, we will be, it will be held from June 14th through the 16th for three days of programming and networking opportunities. Coming up on the horizon, we will be posting the Mobility for All uh, scholarship application as well as the Roadmap Awards. A little bit of information about the Mobility for All Scholarship. The Mobility for All Scholarship provides confidence access to individuals from community-based organizations working in the transportation and equity space. The third annual fourth Roadmap on nomination forms will be coming out soon. And if you would like to hear more information about the Roadmap, tickets, sponsorship, and more, please contact Ashley Duplanty email provided below, and or visit us at roadmapforth.org. Today, we'll be joined by speakers, Kelly Yurick, JC Garcia Sanchez, Nick De Parma, and Peter Crambio. A little bit about our speakers. Kelly is a program manager at Forth. She recently took a 7,500 mile cross-country all-electric road trip and like many who have watched Queen's Gambit this uh, year, or last year, I'd say, um, Kelly has taken up chess and is on her way to becoming a master of the game. So if you have any questions outside of electric transportation, chess related, uh, kick it to uh, Kelly. JC provides an equity and environmental justice lens to an ongoing research project at the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. While he grew up in Orange County, California, JC relied mostly on public transit up through his early years in college and finally buying his own vehicle in graduate school. It wasn't an EV, but we're going to push and um, hopefully this vehicle is an EV. Peter is the CEO and Executive Director at Colorado Car Share. Peter has lived in four countries without a car for at least some time in each. And he also calls the fleet at Colorado Car Share the EV spaceships um, because they are way more fun um, in comparison to traditional ICE vehicles. And finally, our rock star today, Nick is the Director of Business Development at Wonder Mobility. Uh, fun fact about Nick, Nick was in a punk rock band in high school and that was pretty popular in the Boston area. Uh, two of his bandmates ended up in a pretty popular rock band called Dropkick Murphys. And every 10 years, uh, they're asked to do a reunion show. And the last five years, uh, they've been sold out. So needing any music recommendation or a band, um, you can uh, discuss with Nick. And before we start our webinar today, we also have some poll questions to kind of engage our attendees today. Um, our first question uh, is, what industry do you represent? And we'll have that question playing. So if you want to answer this question, show us what industry you are representing today. 
seen a lot of NGOs, academia, others. If, you, if you're in the other section, please leave us a quick note on the attendee chat of what industry you're representing and we can catalog that adequately. Thank you. Our second uh, poll question today is, have you ever participated in a car share program? That's a yes or no question. Have you ever participated in a rideshare program? It's about a 50-50 or 48-50, oh, okay. And then our final question, um, does your community, the community you live in right now, um, does your community have a car share program? That's another yes or no question. Thank you all for participating in the polls. And after that, I will share our brief outline for today. We'll be covering various topics. We'll be getting some introductions and updates to the CRUISE project, the Clean Rural Elect Shared Electric Mobility Project by fourth, um, getting an introduction to Mio Car. It's a rural mobility um, car sharing program in California's Central Valley, Colorado car shares and Wonder, um, Wonder Mobility car sharing platform. And with that, I'll pass it along to our first speaker of the morning. Kelly, take it off. Hi, good morning, everyone. Afternoon for those of you that are not joining from the, the, the West Coast. Um, as Cindy Ott mentioned, and thank you for the wonderful introduction, my name is Kelly Yurick, and I'm a program manager here at Forth. My work includes educating consumers and stakeholders about the benefits of driving electric, leading the project I'm here to discuss today, and consulting with utilities and cities across the country on their transportation electrification efforts. All right, so before I introduce the cruise project specifically, I'd like to start by describing some challenges that exist for introducing new technologies in rural and historically underserved communities. As we know, access to transportation and mobility is strongly connected to economic and social mobility. Having abundant and affordable access to transportation can make a world of difference in an individual's ability to access education, professional development opportunities, childcare, and healthy food choices. In an urban environment, transportation options often include a suite of choices in addition to personal vehicle ownership including public transportation, shared mobility services, and micro-mobility, such as bikes and scooters. These options are often more limited in rural communities because lower population density and larger travel distances make the logistics and economics of sustaining these systems more challenging. Further, to date, much of the adoption and investment in electric vehicles specifically has occurred in urban and more affluent areas the result being lower awareness of EVs and their benefits and the availability of charging infrastructure outside of urban centers and corridors. Forth is committed to improving mobility options for all and believes electrifying and broadening the transportation sector in rural communities is a key part of that strategy. In Hood River, Oregon, uh, which is just about 60 miles um, outside of the Portland, Oregon metro, uh, electric car share could be a perfect complement to the already existing public transportation services, but like other rural communities, it hasn't had the exposure to or experience with any of the major private companies in this space. And then, of course, we're here to talk about car sharing. So in addition to the barriers I've just described, accessing car share programs can also be limited due to language and technology barriers, as well as this, the cost and payment mechanisms often required to access these services. Okay, so on to CRUISE, um, which of course stands for the Clean Rural Shared Electric Mobility Project. Uh, so in this project, we're seeking to address some of the barriers that I just discussed on the previous slide. Uh, the main objective of this project, which is a three-year program that is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy uh, 
It seeks to develop, demonstrate, and refine a financially sustainable model for an electric car share in the rural community of Hood River, Oregon. Ultimately, we'd love to find a model that is replicable, and we will be disseminating results throughout the program um, to other similar communities with the hope of finding opportunities for replication. Meeting the objectives will require data collection, analysis, sharing, and public dissemination of results. We'll be collecting data on trip length, frequency, and charging behavior, um, and the vehicles to help us understand the use patterns for each location and tweak our pricing and marketing approach appropriately. In search of a financially sustainable model, we believe an appropriate measure is how much revenue each car is able to bring in on a monthly basis relative to the cost of maintaining the service um, and paying for uh, the vehicle's uh, lease. We're suggesting a target of five hours per car per day to meet this goal, but the data collected over the course of the project will allow the team to refine outreach and promotion efforts while tweaking the pricing structure to work toward achieving the goal and the model. So a little bit more on what I mean by some of those things now. Um, so over the course of this three-year program, we're going to be putting um, five cars, um, each paired with their own dedicated charging station at five distinct locations throughout Hood River. So um, two of the sites uh, in Hood River will be at affording affordable housing locations to provide access um, for residents there. Uh, two of the sites will be located on the city of Hood River's property, um, one of which we're hoping to be able to leverage um, city employees to provide access to them to use the vehicle in place of an administrative vehicle and hopefully bring down some of the costs associated with mileage reimbursement that the, the city is currently um, taking on. And then finally, the fifth car of the five will be um, placed in a location within Hood River that is intended to um, uh, be centrally located for visitors and tourists to Hood River. And for those of you that may have not um, heard of the, the town of Hood River, it is a, a widely um, visited and, and a very beautiful place in the Columbia River Gorge here in Oregon um, that draws in visitors from probably all over the country um, for uh, wind surfing and um, hiking in the nearby uh, uh, Mount Hood National Forest area. Uh, so there's a lot of different visitors that um, come to the region throughout the year. So we're hoping to um, also, you know, uh, allow the car share to serve um, those guests. Um, and then finally, and I think more importantly um, to some of our conversations that we're gonna to have today, we're hoping to reduce barriers to participation through three technological upgrades that we'll be implementing along with our software provider and car share platform provider, that being Envoy Technologies. We'll be introducing a Spanish language version of the car share application, as well as all of our communication materials will be um, provided in multiple languages. We'll be introducing a tiered pricing structure um, for, uh, to allow us to charge different rates um, based on the user group. So we'll be subsidizing rides for um, lower income users, whereas um, some other users might be uh, charged a more of a market rate, and then some users might be charged an above market rate. Um, and then finally, we'll be introducing alternate payment mechanisms to allow um, for unbanked individuals to participate in the program without requiring um, the possession of a credit card. So I um, want to provide some insights into what has been accomplished to date. Um, though the project began in October of 2019, it didn't kick off in earnest until Q1 of 2020 as we were negotiating final award terms with our funder, the Department of Energy. Um, as we all know, COVID-related stay-at-home orders began um, toward the end of March and continue to varying degrees today. Um, for this project, it slowed progress on a number of fronts, with the most apparent being reduced communications with local partners. Many of our partners, especially those with limited staff, had to prioritize other things in the midst of a public health and economic crisis. Alongside local efforts occurring more slowly, forth work to secure other elements required for the project launch, including the vehicles and charging stations that would be used. 
Uh, we also created and distributed a transportation survey for community residents to better understand transportation behaviors and barriers, as well as general familiarity with electric cars and car sharing. Originally intended to be an in-person survey, these surveys have been distributed digitally, and we're hoping to continue to collect data as we build up to a project, a project launch. Um, we're hoping to complete the last element, uh, that being installing charging stations in the next couple of months, and then we'll roll out our marketing and communication strategy that we finalized last year. And then my final slide here. Um, so that brings us to today. Uh, we are planning for a launch to the public in the second quarter of this year. Uh, we've had a huge win this month in that our first charging station has been installed in Hood River. Um, this is tremendous news for us as we can now begin testing the platform um, on the ground in Hood River with all the pieces together, including the, the vehicle that will be used, um, the charging station, of course, that you see there, and then the software platform all working um, together. We've identified a few local individuals to be EV ambassadors to help us out in this. Um, and that will allow us to gain some visibility to the cars within the community, as well as work out any kinks before inviting the public to join more broadly. Uh, we're also coordinating with several project partners in program communications, um, which includes the local utility Pacific Power, who's also uh, very generously provided um, support and funding for this program the Department of Energy, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and other local partners that are more closely connected to community members. Uh, we're very eager to see this program launched. As you have just seen, it's been a very long time coming um, and certainly without uh, COVID-related delays, but um, we're looking forward to rolling out a, um, a new program for this new rural community uh, in the coming months. And with that, I will turn it over for our next presenter. Thank you so much, Kelly, for updating us on the cruise project. I personally can't wait to visit Hood River, visit my favorite restaurant there, Kickstand, and um, see all of the chargers in person. And next we'll hear from JC Garcia um, Sanchez on Neocar. JC? Yes. Hi, good morning, folks. My name is JC Garcia Sanchez. Uh, <clears throat> and today I'm gonna to be talking about MioCar and the electric, it is the electric vehicle car sharing program, providing transportation resources in rural disadvantaged communities of the San Joaquin Valley here in California. Again, my name is uh, Juan Carlos Garcia Sanchez. I go by JC and I serve as the environmental policy analyst, environmental justice policy analyst at the Policy Institute that is housed at UC Davis Institute of Transportation Studies. Uh, this project is a result of several partnerships that is uh, led by researchers here at UC Davis ITS. And as part of my role, I provide an equity environmental justice lens to the various transportation research projects uh, being rolled out out of ITS. And in, a, in addition, I serve as a, sort of a liaison between community stakeholders, the research community, faculty, and, and the effort is to ensure that research follow best practices with community engagement and outreach. But most importantly, I should note that UC Davis ITS, the Policy Institute, um, we are all committed to working with minority communities of Black, Indigenous, people of color, and other disadvantaged communities to tackle the most pressing issues um, with regards to their transportation challenges. Um, and lastly, the Policy Institute at UC Davis uh, really tries to leverage this research um, and university expertise to engage directly with decision makers to deliver credible and timely informa information and analysis to inform better <clears throat> energy and environmental policy here in California. So what are some challenges with rural uh, transit services? Um, I know that uh, my colleague Kelly, she touched base on a few of them. And of course, um, there is, they are unique to um, to the urban challenges uh, with regards to transportation. Um, and the research community has largely focused on California's densest urban communities, but this project really seeks, seeks, seeks to tackle mobility and transportation in the rural landscape that is the San Joaquin Valley. 
For context, the San, jo San Joaquin Valley is characterized um, as one of the nation's most productive agri agricultural regions. And for decades, these large agricultural operations have provided employment to largely immigrant families from Mexico and Central American countries. However, um, the Calum viral screen, which is a state state tool that uses various metrics to measure impacts identifies the region and the census tracks uh, in this area with high levels of poverty, adverse social condition and degrading, degrading environmental conditions. The transportation challenges in he here in the San Joaquin Valley include uh, very long travel distances, which is not necessarily um, something that that attracts riders and so there's a low transit ridership it's usually high cost for some of these transit services and in addition um, this ultimately impacts the quality and the availability of transit um, and not to mention that these these areas have a high auto ownership costs. In other words, it's really expensive to operate a vehicle, not just here, but um, I'm assuming in other areas as well. However, private vehicles are still the preferred mode of, of transit in this area. Our research in the San Joaquin Valley indicates that there is a, a high level of vehicle ownership per, per household, but uh, a lot of these vehicles um, are not reliable. Folks are hesitant to use some of the vehicles due to lack of proper maintenance. In other words, many of these vehicles are older models, not up to date um, with registration and simply have very serious mechanical issues. And thus, there is a pressing need for mobility in this area. So why electric vehicle car sharing in the Central Valley? Um, like many other rural areas in the San Joaquin Valley, um, this area is challenged with low densities and simply does not attract or have the conditions uh, for private or commercial car sharing. It is very difficult to often find Uber or Lyft or even taxis operating in this area. The prices are typically very high. And so there's, a, again, that pressing need to provide an opportunity uh, via mobility for folks in this region. Car sharing from, a, from the user standpoint does not require much in the sense of capital. And so this initial investment that usually comes with trying to purchase a personal vehicle, that is simply not the case for car sharing services. Uh, in addition, more people are able to benefit from a car sharing service uh, without that significant initial investment. And last but certainly not least, uh, there is significant support at the state and federal level that, that, that supports uh, this transition from internal combustion engine vehicles and more towards electrification, particularly in areas such as the San Joaquin Valley that are faced, as I mentioned, with very difficult environmental conditions. Some of the counties in San Joaquin Valley consistently report some of the worst air qualities in the state. And this is largely due to the profitable agriculture operations, the consistent traffic of heavy duty vehicles that carry these goods throughout the state's major arterials, which run right uh, that bifurcate this area, which are the I-5 and Route 99. So now to the car sharing service, MioCar. MioCar is easy to use. MioCar is an affordable car sharing program operating in Tulare and Kern County in the southern section of the San Joaquin Valley. MioCar uses a round trip model where vehicles can be returned to any of the MioCar stations in affordable housing communities. These affordable housing communities are managed and operated by a partner organization, Self-Help Enterprises, so a big shout out to them. They are the largest developer of affordable housing in the region. The goal of MioCar has always been to keep the program affordable to its members. Our rates have remained the same. And <clears throat> since the service launched, $4 an hour for a uh, $4 an hour, a daily week, weekday rate of $35 per day. And there's a 150 mile limit um, and any mile dry, driven after that, there is activates a charge of 35 cents per mile. Um, some of the available vehicles are Chevy Bolts, Chrysler Pacificas, which is a hybrid Chrysler Pacifica and BMW i3s. We chose the overall best performing vehicles with higher battery range at the most affordable price market. It was very important to us to make sure that these vehicles had a significant amount of range because folks in uh, rural communities tend to drive longer distances. 
Milcar locations. Milcar stations are located across Kern and Tulare County in these six communities, Orosi, Dinuba, Visalia, Wasco, Arvin, and Lamont. Since the service has launched in 2019, we have increased the number of vehicles to 27. Currently, we're closer to about 400 members with varying degrees of usage. In other words, not everyone that becomes a member ends up using the service. And we have reported over 25,000 miles driven with over 1,000 member reservations during this short time period. There's a significant local support that helps us with events. Our goal has always been to work with local partners and civic leaders in these communities to bolster support for the service and cre that increases visibility for the program. It is important to build a network of folks on the ground that has allowed us to organize various marketing and educational events where our team can showcase the vehicles, describe how the service works, and ultimately enlist new users. And the process to enlist is quite simple. There's a few um, requirements, must be 21 or older. Uh, we require a driver's license, of course, in California. Uh, folks are able to gain a driver's license through AB60, regardless of immigration status. We also provide uh, an opportunity for unbanked folks to have a prepaid card and participate in the program. Uh, the registration projects, uh, uh, the registration process, along with fulfilling this this application via uh, a mobile app, allows folks to also connect with our team on the ground that provides them with a brief orientation that helps them in the enrollment process, uh, specifying details in the process to unlock the vehicle. If time allows, one of our team members will meet the new members at a meal car hub to explain the process in person. This team is available on standby on a case, um, in any case there's any issues during the trip. Um, these are some of the guidelines that we provide to our, our members. Um, and I want to point out that since the COVID-19, we have increased our hygiene protocols and make sure that we contracted um, somebody who, who will do additional cleaning and ensure that the proper uh, hygienic protocols are being followed. Um, I want to transition to my last slide here, which is some key takeaways. We are, as part of the research team at UC Davis, uh, we are compiling a report of similar community car share programs trying to identify lessons learned and opportunities from these various programs. While this uh, project is still in progress, there are some significant uh, takeaways that are specific to MioCar that we can share at this moment. Um, it is very important to, uh, number one, the partnerships with community-based organizations or any organization that is embedded is very important. Um, those organizations are always in touch with folks that are um, challenged by availability of transportation resources, but most importantly, those folks have rapport in the local community and will be helpful in the success of your project. In the case of MioCar, our partner organization is Self Help. The community members also need to be involved in the development of the process of car share services, whether it be through focus groups, through meetings and surveys. Uh, this often calls for power sharing, which is critical in developing strong partnerships. Uh, and in the case of MioCar, we have uh, put together a steering committee of residents that participates in these various events. Educational sessions are quite important because uh, not everybody is familiar with EVs. Um, there's significantly uh, a need to, to make sure that folks are not intimidated by these new shiny technologies and people have a lot of questions. So providing a platform is important. Um, enrolling new members can often be challenging, but having a team that is culturally sensitive provides outreach and market opportunities to enroll new members is key. The service has gained significant recognition in other municipalities in areas that would like to see new car stations expand to their communities. And lastly, car sharing services are unique to the geography and social dynamic of each community. What works in the San Joaquin Valley may not be necessarily uh, the right fit for your community, but there is a lot of overlap in car sharing services should not be a one size fits approach. Ultimately, you really need to find the right balance and the right people to meet the specific needs of your community. Thank you.
Thank you so much, JC, for sharing the work of Miocar and your work in working with the community um, to make sure they have the access and the opportunity to get these vehicles. And our third speaker will hear from Peter. Peter? Yeah, hi everyone, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm coming to you from a uh, uh, snowy, cold, 20 degree uh, Denver, Colorado right now. I appreciate um, being here with you all. As mentioned, I'm with Colorado Car Share, and um, what I'd like to do is give you a bit of an overview about our organization, some work in car sharing we've been doing for a number of years, uh, kind of what we're up to right now, and then um, how we've both been impacted and are responding to the current crisis. So as I'm sure pretty much all of us can relate to, uh, 2020 was a pretty huge uh, year that included, at least for us organizationally, some relatively significant seismic shifts. So first and foremost, we had to survive the crisis, which we've done so far, knock on wood. Um, but if that wasn't enough, we decided, oh, this would be a great year to do a complete name and rebrand. So we were up until then uh, Ego Car Share and recently relaunched as Colorado Car Share while um, also really moving significantly into our electrification efforts um, and expanding more substantively into lower and mixed income uh, community areas, which has always been a part of what we've done, but really wanted to amplify that moving forward. So uh, Colorado Car Share is actually 22 years young this year. Um, we've been bootstrapping our, our finance to get car sharing going for over two decades now. And we are um, Colorado's first only and one of the nation's longest running car share orgs, pr probably actually one of the nation's few remaining nonprofit um, car share orgs. And our mission is really to empower our community to live a car-free lifestyle and um, have that positive impact on our individual and collective health, wealth, and um, shared environment. And as an organization, as a nonprofit, we do that with kind of a two-tiered approach. So on one side, we have our education, outreach, and advocacy around um, non-single occupancy uh, vehicle mobility options and what those other alternatives can look like. And then in tandem, we have um, a car share service that we provide basically to our 3,500 or so members around the Denver metro region um, and access to about 50 vehicles fleet wide, which I'll get into a little bit more here. So as mentioned, we're all around the um, Denver Metro um, in the county and city of Denver, uh, downtown and other areas, as well as in um, Boulder County, which is where we were founded. Um, traditionally, so obviously we've been doing this well before EVs came along. So traditionally we've always focused on super fuel efficient and for example, hybrid vehicles, which are the majority of our fleet. Um, but we also have specialty vehicles like our all wheel drives with ski racks and bike racks and uh, pickup trucks and things like that. And the idea being that in many cases we can be individuals or families um, second or third car so they don't have to have those additional vehicles um, on their own. So one of our goals has always been to really connect car share locations with complementary mobility options nearby um, and through in particular partnerships really support mixed income communities where for example um, transit can be the backbone of that area but we can come in and complement those alternative additional mobility options or in the case where maybe transit doesn't readily exist be a primary focal point for mobility options for people who can't or don't want to own their own vehicles. Um, and a, a, a big part of this is operating, for example, in um, affordable housing areas and multifamily and se senior units, for example, where um, in many of these cases, uh, public transportation might be subsidized through other means. And then, and then we can kind of come in and provide that, you know, complement that with our own discounts 
which can include the likes of, and, and often do in many places, um, waived application fees, uh, car share credits, and significantly reduce uh, um, car share rates and membership rates, for example, over what our free market rates are. So our journey to, um, to electrification really goes back to about 2017 when we commissioned a graduate student to really help us think about what a roadmap to electrifying could look like, um, both internally in terms of, of our own you know, operations and financial constraints, but also externally in terms of partnerships, um, locations. We don't own infrastructure, so what do those charging station partnerships look like? Um, and then really we launched in around 2019 with our first couple of EVs with the goal to be the nation's first um, nonprofit car share organization, really with the intent um, to help to create a successful and a scalable model that can be replicated elsewhere. And um, now we're at 12, we're about to launch our 13th EV. Um, and so we're, that's now putting us at about 25% or so of our fleet. So it's, you know, it's not all happening at once. As I mentioned, we're bootstrapping everything as we go along. So it's been uh, a, a, a slow, but a great journey. So a part of this, as I mentioned, includes a lot of partnerships with local other nonprofits, organizations, municipalities. Um, we're, we're launching an amazing partnership with the city of Denver. Um, where we are, and this is being supported through the CARES Act, where we're launching electrified car share programs in about a half a dozen underserviced communities. Um, and that's really meant to be a part of the pandemic relief, recovery, and resiliency efforts. Um, so we're super excited about that. And really our goal here is to, is to combine the, um, the, you know, the social equity, the sustainability, and the resiliency efforts in these communities that may not otherwise have inclusive uh, transportation options, particularly if an organization like ours wasn't servicing in those areas. So as mentioned, um, and as with many ORs, we were hit really quite significantly with COVID-19 um, to, to the point where going back to last March when lockdown first hit, we pretty much lost about 90% of our revenue nearly overnight, um, which you know that then resulted in a variety of emergency measures, cost-cutting measures. Um, fortunately, we were able to save all of our staff. Um, uh, I basically became an emergency grant writer um, and you know implemented a, a variety of other things. Um, but one of the things that we discovered through that process. And although it's still anecdotal, we've, we've really seen it, um, particularly in certain uh, geographic and socioeconomic areas, which is that we became a lifeline for many of our members. Um, so through all of that, we managed to, um, to recover relatively well, knock on wood so far. Um, and, and, I, and I think that maybe a part of it is to the detriment of public transit because you know folks still have not to an extent returned to that. Um, whereas through a lot of, um, you know, cleaning and additional measures with our fleet and our communications, they have been okay with um, returning to car sharing services, for example. So a big part of our own recovery, uh, as well as really activating a safety net for our community during the pandemic, um, this effort included, you know, offering free to uh, extremely discounted credit for the likes of um, medical and healthcare and other frontline workers, uh, volunteers, and really um, for vulnerable, the, our community's most vulnerable members. So really trying to support them through all of that. To ensure that we're meeting um, our mission and serving our community, we really track and survey constantly um, numerous data points around like use, demographics, income level, how well we're doing and a variety of other touch points so that we can really um, measure our own success, but also help to educate the public and our other partners. So for example, you can see on this slide where um, the majority of family household incomes who are car share members are at or below inclusive of the 50 to $74,000 family income level. Um, but also keeping in mind that we operate in the open market. So we have individuals and families with higher income levels who choose to car share for other reasons. 
Um, and we work, of course, with uh, other organizations, businesses, nonprofits, um, the local university, and municipality departments. Uh, you can see here, we also track and find it very important to see what impact we're having on, um, you know, since people became car share members, have they increased their use of public transit or walking or biking so that we can really see that what we're doing is complementing other modes of non-single occupancy vehicle ownership. Um, and along with that, we, uh, we try to track reduction in pollutants like carbon and other pollution emissions. So ultimately, we feel that um, we're having a significant impact. You know, if you look at, and this is both from the education outreach standpoint, but also from a service perspective. So like, if you look at these impacts on this screen, which is on a per round trip car share station basis, um, and then multiply that by our 50 plus vehicles and 3,500 members around the Denver Boulder County region, um, you can see that we're having a pretty substantive impact over the last couple of decades. And we feel that this is um, especially true and important in those lower and mixed income community areas uh, that we operate in where transportation options might be limited if we weren't operating in those areas. And with that, I will say thank you and turn it back over. Thank you so much, Peter. And our final presenter today will be hearing from Nick at Wonder Mobility. Nick? Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, I'm Nick DePrima from Wonder Mobility. Um, I wanted to, first of all, uh, thank the team from Forth, uh, particularly um, Kelly and Steve, um, also uh, JC from Meocar and uh, Peter uh, from Colorado Car Share um, for congratulations on uh, being able to stick through a really tough year and come out on top. And um, it's really our priority at Wonder Mobility to provide the technology that uh, serves organizations like yours and, and to move the ball forward. Um, uh, as I uh, told you before, my name is Nick DePrima. Um, they mentioned in my fun fact that I used to play in a punk band in high school. And, you know, one of the uh, one of the things I remember is we used to get excited when we would be the headlining act. And that meant you went blast. Um, what that also meant is that uh, it was up to you to sort of make up any uh, overages on time. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to help uh, play that role here as well. Um, it's a, a super great opportunity to talk to, uh, to talk to all of you. So I came to Wonder Mobility two years ago um, after helping uh, traditional car rental technology companies uh, to launch new products and to innovate in that industry. Um, I came to Wonder two years ago to help them uh, to launch uh, their products for sharing, uh, for shared mobility into North America. Uh, Wonder is a six-year-old uh, next-generation transportation tech company headquartered in Hamburg. One of our founders is from Germany and the other is from the U.S. And uh, that's why it made sense for them to uh, expand into the North American market uh, starting two years ago. So we're trying to accelerate the transition to green technology and shared transportation by developing uh, good tech, uh, next generation technology that lowers the cost. A uh, unique value proposition at Wonder is that we offer both technology for, for fleet sharing. Uh, Wonder Fleet, for example, is used uh, by uh, scooter companies all over uh, the US as well as uh, North America. And Wonder Rent is really our response to uh, the need for scheduled and location-based sharing. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. In addition to sharing technology, we also provide ride hailing technology through Wonder Shuttle and Wonder Carpool. And then we have technology that helps uh, cities like Hamburg, Germany to aggregate data uh, from multiple transportation uh, companies uh, so that they can look at trends and, and do forecasting and planning. Uh, we have about 150 people uh, primarily um, in Germany. Uh, we opened an office in Los Angeles uh, last year, and I'm grandfathered uh, working from my home in Boston. Uh, prior to COVID, I was working uh, primarily out of a suitcase. 
Um, we've worked with companies from uh, large manufacturers like BMW, uh, electric vehicle manufacturers like Lucid Motors, uh, some of the companies that are, are um, that we serve today that are uh, really exciting um, have to do with um, you know residential uh, car sharing uh, as well as um, uh, station-based rentals uh, done via uh, purely an app. So, uh, so we um, uh, completed our uh, another round of funding uh, in September of 2019, um, and we started rolling out our uh, platform here in the states. And in the U.S., it really had a different set of challenges uh, than we faced in Europe. Um, and one of those challenges is really the um, the size of the operations here. And so while in Europe, we were doing business with very large providers primarily, as well as some bootstrappers um, here in North America, a lot of the car sharing projects are dealing with what we would classify as smaller fleets or fleets under 50 units. Um, and so uh, we really had to adapt our technology for the U.S. market. While we have some great customers here already, we wanted to push that ball forward um, in the U.S. market, for example. A station-based model where vehicles, like Mio uh, Car was describing, are done uh, in a round-trip basis is much more popular, while in Europe, uh, free-floating sharing is more popular. Um, we also face challenges where a lot of the hardware that was implemented in the European systems was very hardwired and complicated to install. And so right away, we identified the, the what's called IoT hardware that sits in the vehicle uh, to be a challenge. And then the last was how fast can we uh, bring these products to market? Um, because what we're trying to do is push shared technology and EV technology forward by reducing the cost of these types of programs so that they can be more easily implemented and more readily available. Just as this was happening, um, we had our COVID-19 issues uh, uh, just really wreak havoc across technology and transportation. And so <clears throat> while our team uh, got hit um, with these business issues relating to COVID, um, instead of just resting on our laurels, uh, we started a marketing campaign called We All Move. And this We All Move campaign allowed fleet owners, car sharing providers, uh, Hertz was involved, uh, as well as Enterprise, um, and what they were doing is making their unused vehicles available for essential workers to use during the, uh, some of the early uh, uh, parts of the pandemic. Um, and so we put our team uh, to good use in the, mean, in the meantime. So this We All Move initiative uh, helped us to stay busy uh, while the business conditions were not ideal uh, in part of last year, uh, while we continue to develop our technology and move it forward. And so with the new optimism and modern approach to sharing technology, we're ready for 2021. One of these things that we're doing um, is helping to make uh, uh, transportation accessible and affordable. Um, uh, so we acquired uh, uh, technology for car sharing uh, from an Australian company called Keys. It moved our own technology uh, forward rapidly. And so now we're developing on top of this already robust platform uh, from our headquarters in Hamburg, Germany, and coordinating with our clients here in the U.S. and all over the world uh, to accelerate the development of these platforms. And so, um, so again, what we're trying to do is make self-service rentals and car sharing something that's affordable and scalable and something that doesn't require you know a million dollars every time you want to get it live and so having solved the uh, and, and working on a solution to have a replicable and scalable program we've also partnered with geotab um, and are the first self-service uh, sharing technology company to be integrated with the geotab keyless access system so now we have a reduced cost uh, and low uh, implementation cost hardware um, a scalable system. And so now we're starting to expand into the communities. Uh, so whether we're implementing um, self-service uh, vans um, at remote locations um, or we're operating 
um, with cities like Christchurch, New Zealand on a shared use vehicle. So they have corporate fleets that are shared with the public um, when they're not being used um, and community car sharing programs uh, like the ones discussed today. Uh, so we're doing the best we can to lower the cost, uh, lower the implementation timeline and really move the ball forward. Uh, we appreciate the work that we've done with fourth this year. Um, so we have we have projects that um, allow for uh, communities that are interested in launching shared mobility programs, but maybe can't stomach the entire cost. Uh, we've partnered with fourth to uh, essentially uh, do some cost sharing and to lower the barrier for uh, communities that want to enter uh, into these types of programs. So really appreciate your time today and uh, look forward to hearing uh, from you in the future. But please let me know anytime I can help. Thank you so much, Nick, for your presentation. And now we'll be entering the Q&A and I ask all of the speakers and panelists today to please turn on your webcam and unmute yourself while we um, get into the Q&A. Thank you all. Um, my first question is regarding, we've all discussed COVID and COVID impacts, but I wanted to ask, how are you all approaching the challenges of recruiting new members or returning mem members slash writers in a post-COVID world? Um, and I will open this up to Kelly first, and we can go from Kelly um, and then anyone that wants to add into this? How are we looking at post-COVID recruiting new members or having existing members stay on our platforms? Yeah, great question. Uh, so I, I, I think I'll first just share that for the cruise project, we will really only be recruiting new members. Um, and similar to some of the, the things that other panelists have shared, um, we'll be communicating with the public pretty clearly about the protocols that we're putting in place to make sure that the cars are kept clean and ultimately riders are kept safe. Um, and so that's probably gonna be our biggest um, you know, messaging opportunity. There will be signage in and around the vehicles to allow for that. Um, but I also just want to share a perspective that one of our partners shared with me earlier in 2020 um, that I think is gives me a lot of hope for uh, the, the launch of this program and also perhaps the success of other car share programs that are um, in place right now is that, um, you know, we're we're obviously in the midst of a crisis right now. And um, history has shown us that in the midst of crisis, um, good change can happen. And people are often receptive to trying new things, new behaviors, new habits. And so I'm really hopeful that um, as people start to go back out into um, what normal life will look like after COVID, um, that they'll be open to trying something new and perhaps car sharing is is that new thing for them and that it works out um, to work really well and, and maybe even um, be an improvement over their previous uh, transportation solutions. Thank you. Um, JC, do you have anything to add to that or I will open it up? Yeah, I would say that for uh, our experiences with Miocar has been that COVID-19 definitely impacted um, initially during that first wave. However, there's such a pressing need. And as I mentioned, during the challenges with regards to rural mobility, there's already sort of a limited amount of transportation available. And therefore we saw uh, sort of an uptake of, of uh, new members because there's such a demand for mobility and folks needing to, to get to work, to go to, you know, uh, medical appointments because of course that is a pressing need and and they're, they're they are also being used for other purposes going to school or even just daily routine daily tasks such as going to the supermarket um, and so we definitely saw a little bit of a uh, uh, of a reduced uh, ridership early on but um, as the pandemic continue and less less uh, resources were available for mobility, we saw an uptick in usage of Miocar. Nick, from from a technology perspective, we definitely had more demand in controls relating to hygiene 
Uh, so being able to space uh, and buffer the time in between bookings uh, to allow for proper hygiene, uh, maybe some stickering and labeling to make people feel more comfortable that this has happened. Um, but at the same time, you had concerns about hygiene relating to sharing. You also had the situation where people no longer wanted sort of a full service experience. And so the idea of um, going directly to the car in order to access it and bypassing your traditional sort of, um, you know, key management and things like that. Um, there was a, a, an increase in the demand for that sort of thing. So it's, um, it was a, an interesting time, um, but uh, reshuffled some of the priorities from a, a developer standpoint. Peter, any extra things to add on that? Um, not too much. You know, as I mentioned, we took a pretty significant and immediate overnight impact. Um, but we also saw that particularly as we became more of a lifeline service for others, that there was a natural shift, particularly in certain demographic areas from the likes of public transportation over to us. Um, and then the other big area of focus was through our partnerships, like with um, municipalities and properties and things like that. Thank you. The next question will be in regards to funding. This was a question that was posed earlier on. Um, how do we navigate long-term funding requirements or resources to help support the, the subsidies for EV car sharing programs? How do we make sure that um, these programs, um, whether it's in rural or urban areas, they're very beneficial to the community? How do we make sure these are long-term projects um, not projects, but programs that are um, stationary in our communities. Um, JC, do you want to take that first? Then we can go through. I think uh, the the process began on January 20th, right, with the shift of our administration. And really, that's where the, com the money comes from for a lot of these projects, at least for me, Okar, it does. And seeing that there's a shift in really addressing these topics is ultimately EVs in the Central Valley are going to affect the adverse environmental conditions and really transition folks into elect electrifying the passenger fleet. And I think if that's being prioritized at you know the higher levels of, of government, um, that's really going to allow us to continue having sustainable programs uh, that the community can benefit from. Sorry. Oh, sorry, uh, Peter, you had something to say. Yeah, I, I you know, I was just going to say from our perspective, um, you know, we've been doing this for over two decades now. And as I mentioned, it was a, it was a small community based startup. Right. And to an extent, we still are. Um, I think that there is a risk that you run in depending too much on earned income, which is what we've done over the years primarily. And I've been trying to diversify um, versus the opposite end of the spectrum where you get a big, big grant, big chunk of money, money, and then you just hope that it will, you know, uh, continue in perpetuity. And that's a danger. Um, so, you know, our what we've been trying to do is really find that right balance. Like you've got you've got because you can't depend on the next administration or where your next grants coming from. You know, you've got to really focus and hone in on your um, your break even point And, you know, how, how can you at least to an extent survive um, operationally? with a large chunk of that being earned income, but then really focusing on your partnerships, your sponsorships in kind or otherwise, and your larger donors, grants, et cetera. It's a balancing act. Um, Kelly, Nick, any addition or should we move on to the next I'll take the no. I'll take that as a no. And I know we do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, we most likely won't be able to answer them all, but rest assured that our speakers will be available afterwards offline to continue the conversation. We'll also um, have other opportunities for you to um, to get your info, um, questions answered. Um, my last question, as we are at 11 o'clock now, um, I want us to take off our crystal ball. Um, we're looking in the future five years from now. Um, 
what does the next five years in the space um, of community car sharing look like? And with that, I wanted to ask, what are the key measures of um, success beyond utilization rate can we look at to say, okay, this is a successful program? Um, I will start with um, Nick, and then we'll do Peter, JC, and end with Kelly. So there are a few disruptive things from the technology side uh, coming to play over the next five years. Uh, one of one of the ways is how we actually connect to the vehicles. Um, so while t while today typically there's an aftermarket hardware being installed into the cars, uh, the manufacturers are working like crazy to own this piece of the technology uh, and then license it out. Um, and uh, and so this this ability to uh, lock and unlock the vehicle, disable and enable the vehicle, will likely be something that the, that we're coordinating through our technology with the manufacturer. Uh, that has a lot of impact on where the uh, where you know sort of who can do these things and how it works. Um, you know the other the other sort of um, thing that's in the back of everybody's head is really the um, advancements in self-driving vehicles and things like that. Um, where, you know, being able to push a button in the, a car is at my doorstep tomorrow at 8 a.m. for me to drive um, is something that will disrupt. Is that five years away or 10 years away is yet to see. Yet to be determined. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, I would I would echo what Nick said on the technology integration side, um, including, you know, obviously thinking through the future of autonomous electrified shared um, mobility services. I also think that, um, you know, what we're seeing more and more is the is the multimodal, multimodal integration. So, um, you know, how, how does how do we work with with one app that it, it can support um, car sharing, bike sharing, public transit? We've worked on pilot projects on that in the past. Uh, through some grant support, um, and I, I look forward to seeing how that integration will probably pan out in the next five years or so. Um, in terms of measures of success for us, for me, um, it all started having a sustainability background with carbon emissions reductions. Like that was my razor focus forever. Like that's all that matters. If we don't address this, we're all we're all in bad shape. Um, and other pollution and traffic and safety and all of that. But then also on the social equity side, success is measured through um, socially equitable access, right? Because we're not transportation providers, we're access providers for vital human services for everyone. And that's how we measure success. Thank you. JC? Yeah, not much to add. I think you kind of wrapped it up nicely. Um, our measure of success has been to continue expanding MioCart to provide more access to more people. And hopefully in five years, there'll be MioCars throughout the Central Valley in, in more counties um, and trying to shift, uh, you know, the, the trying to shift the emissions in the opposite direction, make sure that folks are not impacted negatively by adverse environmental conditions. Yeah, and I'll just, you know, echoing a lot of what everyone else just what just shared, um, speaking specifically for crews, you know, we're certainly looking to be able to replicate this program in other communities. Um, we're certainly going to learn a lot throughout this journey that we're taking and um, hopefully applying that um, in a great way uh, in other communities. But I think ultimately thinking bigger picture, um, thinking about how this program, the car share can fit into larger uh, the larger transportation picture for for someone and and how they get around. Um, my hope is that it it's an improvement and that it's um, it opens up opportunities for them that that maybe weren't there before. Um, with that, um, thank you all so much for joining us today and hearing our panelists speak on electrified community car sharing. We hope it's been very informative. I want to say thank you directly to our panelists, Nick. Peter, JC, and Kelly uh, for joining us and sharing your insights. Um, if you have any questions, like I mentioned, we did not get through all of the questions today. Our, um, our presenters' emails are on the screen right now, but we will be sharing some more information in the webinar recap. 
And we hope you can join us for the next webinar in our winter spring webinar series on Tuesday, February 9th at 10 a.m. We'll be discussing driving change, designing, and financing transportation electrification projects. We'll hear from Ford's program manager, um, Sam, and we'll also be joined by NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. We'll be hearing from the U.S. Department of Energy um, to, and Portland General Electric for, uh, for some more information and we'll focus on steps involved in securing funding for a transportation electrification demonstration project. So we've talked about a live project of live projects in electrification transportation. Next, we'll discuss how to finance those. So we hope you can all join us again. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday and we hope to see you again uh, in two weeks. Thank you all.